five, four, three, two, one. Hey, Shagheads, Curtis Tucker here with another exciting episode of the Shaggy Duck Podcast. Hey, guess what? Two podcasts in a week. Trying to make up for some of the missed podcasts that I've done. I uh, got my window open. You can hear the airplanes outside. If you guys are listening to this podcast, don't forget that you can go to youtube.com and uh, look up Curtis Tucker, uh, youtube.com slash at Curtis Tucker, and you can watch this and I'll be waving at you like I am right now. Or if you're watching this on YouTube on the video, don't forget that you can take me with you on any one of your favorite podcasting apps and listen to me while you're driving, cutting the grass, or out on the trail. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your podcasting app and also on YouTube, I'm trying to get my uh, viewer hours up on YouTube. So maybe I can make a buck or two on there. So I uh, am going to try to plan on doing more of these, more videos, and all of that good stuff. If you missed, the earlier in the week episode, I did an episode on our interview with Paul Stanley and then also threw in the information from the prior interview with Gene Simmons. So appreciate you guys. If you're looking on YouTube, I have my bright gold yellow Art O'Rooney t-shirt on with my fun cartoony retro looking design on there. You can go to Art O'Rooney.com. You can check out all the t-shirts there. Uh, I am going to be uploading a lot more designs, a lot of fun 70s and retro and mid-century modern and pop art and just all kinds of fun art designs on there. And as soon as I get to painting, some of my paintings will be on there. And so it's artorooney.com or art-o-rooney.com. And that is taken off the old 70s phrase, Coolerooney. So that's where that came from. But anyway, check out my website. Check out the t-shirt designs. I will be adding long sleeve t-shirts here pretty quick and uh, lots of sweatshirts as well. So I appreciate everybody that has already purchased t-shirts. That is very cool of you all. And I appreciate all of you guys that are checking in on this episode of the Shaggy Life Podcast. I appreciate you guys listening every time that I upload an episode. And again, I'll try to get more regular with that. If you guys have any show ideas or if there's a podcast subject in the past that you guys have really liked and you want me to continue doing more of that, let me know. You can email shags at shaggyduck.com or curtis at curtistucker.com. And also don't forget that a lot of these podcast and video episodes are also typed out as a blog post at curtistucker.com like this one is. Uh, this episode you can catch over at curtistucker.com. And then what I usually try to do also is embed at the bottom of the text as I embed the podcast and the video so you can pick which way you want to check out the episode. So go check that out on uh, curtistucker.com. And so today is uh, September 12th, meaning yesterday was September 11th. And most of us know that as 9-1-1. And so there were a lot of posts yesterday of remembrance and just uh, kind of everybody being a little sullen and a little you know, just remembering what happened uh, all those years ago. And uh, I noticed a lot of people on social media were posting, you know, where they were when they first noticed what was going on or, or saw the plane hit the first tower or saw the news report or were told or, um, you know, all of that stuff. So that got me to thinking there is a name for that, for remembering an event uh, or something like that from from years back, and it is called a flash bulb memory. And so, if you remember where you were when a nine one one, when you found out uh, what was going on with nine one one, that is a flash bulb memory. A lot of people uh, slightly older than me and and people my age, they it, it kind of started with the JFK assassination. So, if you remember where you were when you heard when JFK was assassinated, 
uh, that is a flashbulb memory. So that got me uh, to thinking, oh, well, I've probably had several flashbulb memories over the past several decades. So uh, real quick, I got a little bit of information. Uh, a flashbulb memory is a vivid memory about an emotionally significant event, usually a historic or notable event. People often experience these memories in a photographic detail and can recall aspects like what they were doing when the event occurred or how they learned about what happened. Again, uh, either you were there when the event happened or you remember when somebody told you or you remember it uh, coming on TV. Flashbulb memories tend to endure over long periods of time, although it's not clear if people continue to remember the events with accuracy. And I will kind of get into a little bit of that as I go through some of my uh, flashbulb memories because uh, as I'm writing them down, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I remember that. But then when I start thinking of some of the details, I kind of start to lose some of the memory and some of the sharpness, and it kind of starts to get a little fuzzy. Uh, the term flashbulb memory was coined by Roger Brown and James Colick in 1977. Yay, kudos to the 70s. Uh, they published a paper that year. They were studying how people remembered the JFK assassination and noted that these memories were formed with certain qualities. People remembered the JFK assassination with uncanny clarity, including detail about where they were at the exact moment they heard and what their emotional reaction was. Uh, so again, uh, I started thinking back to what were all of the flashbulb memories that I have in the past. And so I've got a list of them right here. And what I'm going to do is go in chronological order from the oldest to the most recent and uh, just kind of give you guys, uh, you know, my flashbulb memories. You guys let me know, uh, be thinking about what your flashbulb memories are. And then a lot of these you guys are going to probably remember. Uh, some of them you're not because they're more local or just, you know, my memories of something happened. But so the first memory that I have that I'll always remember, uh, I don't know that I could ever forget, is uh, the 1973 flood in Enid, Oklahoma. And it's real easy for me to remember that because I was living in Enid, Oklahoma. I think I was about 11, I believe I was 11 years old when the uh, 73 flood happened in October. And I don't, I didn't uh, write down all of the details, but um, one of the worst floods, if not still the worst flood, uh, the most amount of rain in the shortest amount of time in Oklahoma. And uh, basically a storm just came over Enid and it just started raining and it just rained and rained and rained and rained. And it didn't last for like, you know, days. It, it just lasted for hours and hours and hours, but there was just so much rain that um, it flooded the entire town. Uh, there were uh, lives lost, a lot of destruction. And so uh, I remember it because uh, we were living on South Johnson Street. Uh, my mom was renting a house, so uh, my mom and dad had been divorced, and my sister and I were latchkey kids. And so I remember uh, I'm pretty sure it was on a Wednesday night, uh, and I, I remember that because my mom wasn't home. She was bowling that night, and I believe Wednesday night was her bowling night. So uh, she was gone bowling. The storm started, and uh, it just kept raining. And again, this is 1973. This is before multiple channels. This is before cell phones, before internet, uh, all that. So it uh, started to rain, uh, kept raining, continued to rain. And eventually, uh, what? oh, and so the house that we were renting on South Johnson was directly across the street from my great-grandma, Ethel Valentine Irwin. And so she lived across the street and liked to sit in her front window and kind of look at the neighbors. And so that gave her a bird's eye view of our house so she could kind of keep an eye on us when my mom was gone. And so I think that was the reason my mom had rented that house. And so she was probably at that time in her 90s, um, and she never learned to drive, never owned a car, uh, but she, you know, sat over there in her house. And so eventually, as the rain kept coming down that evening, you know, we were kids not thinking much about it, but she eventually called us on the landline and asked us to come over to her house. And she probably was watching the 
weather, you know, on one of the three news channels that we get, even though the weather wasn't, you know, as high tech as it is today. But um, so it kept raining. So she, I think at that point, she had noticed water in her basement. She wanted us to come over and help um, take care of her basement. And so I remember, like I said, lived directly across the street. I remember crossing the street and the water being so high everywhere. And it was the street, uh, you know, we have the regular streets with the, I don't know, four inch curb, but the water was at least uh, running down the streets up to the curb level. So, you know, our feet were uh, basically underwater. The water was coming down in torrential, you know, waves. And so uh, just getting across the street, we were drenched, but we got over to her house and went down to her basement and she had a rickety old wooden staircase. It was narrow and pretty steep and it was a little hard for her to uh, get up and down. So she gave us some buckets and told us to go down and, um, you know, kind of haul up water. So we went down there and I don't know how, I can't remember how much water was down there, uh, probably a couple of inches, but uh, in her basement up just above head level were these these small skinny windows that basically looked out onto the the driveway. And that was so if you wanted some light down in the basement or fresh air, you could open those windows and you could get some fresh air down in the basement. Well, over time, they weren't sealed really well and there was cracks next to them. And so that was allowing all of the rain that was running down the driveway to also go through those cracks and start flooding her basement. And so basically we would scoop up some water in a bucket, go up the skinny stairs and the door from the basement, basically, if you went directly out it and across the little hallway, you went into her back porch and there was a door to the outside. So we'd just take the water and toss it out in the backyard. Well, basically what was happening was it was raining so hard that all of that water would just all run back down the driveway and back down into the window. And so um, I don't know that we did any good. I don't remember how much rain she got down in her basement. And, uh, and then my mom, she was bowling and the bowling alley was less than a mile, almost just close to a mile from our house. But there was kind of in Enid, basically from our house to the bowling alley, there was an intersection that was kind of low. And so it would flood even when there wasn't a super heavy rain. But so that whole area was flooded. There was actually cars floating down the street. And so uh, once they realized what was happening with the flooding, um, I think they stopped the bowling and my mom was trying to get home and she couldn't get home from all the streets that would take her directly to our house because they were all flooded. Um, cars were underwater. Cars were floating away. So she had to drive like kind of out of town and all the way around and come in, uh, you know, from the back. And I think it was so late by that time that um, we had, uh, my sister and I had probably gone to bed. I don't really remember her getting there. But um, so the next day, uh, I think it was still raining the next day. And then when it finally stopped, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, a few deaths in town and a lot of destruction. So that is uh, my first um, flashbulb memory. And basically, because it's real easy to remember because I was there and experienced it. My next one uh, is from 1977, and it was the day that Elvis died. And so growing up, my mom was a huge Elvis fan had uh, Elvis albums all over the house. Uh, she would play Elvis eight tracks in her car. And I even, another flashbulb memory, which I'm not really going to get into, but I remember when Elvis did his concert in the round in the black leather suit, when he was kind of making that comeback. I remember the night that was on that my mom set up a reel to reel tape recorder and, you know, put the microphone up to the television and recorded that whole special onto a reel-to-reel. -reel. And I still have that reel-to-reel -reel player and that actual reel-to-reel -reel tape. So, uh, so she was a big fan. You know, um, I was a fan just because it was a lot of music that I heard growing up. And then as kids, 
in the 70s. You know, the only movies that we really got to see were on Friday and Saturday night. And a lot of times there'd be an Elvis movie on. And so it was always kind of fun to watch the Elvis movie. So, so when I found out that he had died, um, it wasn't a huge shock because he had kind of been out of the limelight uh, for quite a while and had gotten older. And uh, if you had seen him, he was a little overweight. Uh, but my mom was still a huge fan. So anyway, we were living on West. So we had moved from South Johnson, where we lived during the 73 flood, and we'd moved about four blocks to the north uh, on Johnson at the corner of Johnson and Broadway. And so our address was actually a Broadway address. And so that was a two-story house where I had the bedroom upstairs. Um, and so uh, I was downstairs and the phone rang and I answered it. And it was my mom's best friend, Dottie Johnson. And she asked, if my mom was home, and I said no, uh, and she said well, and I can't remember if she was crying or not. Uh, probably she was probably upset, but uh, she said, "Well, when your mom gets home, tell her that Elvis has died." And I was like, "Oh, wow, okay." And again, not a super shock to me, uh, being a little bit younger. And I don't remember if I told my mom if I was at home when she got home or if I had gone off to play and she had already found out through the news or whatever. But I just remember that's how I found out that Elvis had died was my mom's best friend calling that day. So uh, the next uh, flash bulb memory that I have uh, is uh, March of 1981. I was still in high school, senior in high school, graduated in May of 1981. But in March of 1981, President Reagan was shot. And I remember that it was in the afternoon because I was home from school and I was in the living room. And at that time, we had moved from West Broadway over to South Grant, which was literally, again, just a few blocks. So basically, those three houses that we lived in were literally within probably six blocks, all of each other. We just kept living in the same neighborhood, but uh, moving into different rent houses. So we were living on South Grant and um, my mom was at work and my sister was gone somewhere. But I remember, I think I must've been, and I kind of think we might have had cable by then. Uh, but if we did, I think I was probably watching one of the uh, major networks, NBC, CBS, or uh, ABC. And I remember the news came on that um, there was that there was a shooting, and Reagan had been rushed away. And so, uh, at that time, we had those big, heavy, fat TVs, and we did not have remote control. And so, my mom had this big wicker. Uh, Papasan chair that came with this wicker footstool. And so I put the footstool up by the television and I sat there with the uh, dial and would flip between uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC trying to get, you know, updates. And, uh, you know, they at first were saying that there was a shooting and that the president had been rushed away and that James Baker had been shot. And then as more news came in, they said, yes, uh, President Reagan had been shot. And then at one point they reported that James Baker had died. And then they reported that um, Ronald Reagan had been shot bad enough that he had to be rushed to the hospital and was in surgery. And then they came back and said that James Baker had not died. And I kind of remember one of the news anchors uh, being really upset. I, my memory, I thought it was that he was upset uh, because Reagan had been shot, but it, I think it was Frank Reynolds on ABC, but I think he was upset because he had told the country that James Baker had died and uh, he hadn't. And it was, so this was before internet, before 24 hour news, before really live news stories. So what they, you know, what they did was the news was live at a desk, but the, the, anchor was basically reading from a teleprompter. And then every news story mostly was something that they had already filmed. And so it wasn't like they were doing a lot of live or going to somebody live. And so uh, getting that information in, they literally had a regular telephone landline right next to him and he would pick it up and listen for, you know, there'd be silence and he would listen and put it down and 
and give updates on um, what was going on with Reagan and the suspect. And, and then somebody every now and then would hand him a piece of paper. This was before computers. Uh, and he would read off of this little white piece of paper that somebody had written a note. And so that's how he was getting his updates. And so I just kind of remember, um, you know, following that story. And uh, so that's how um, I learned that Ronald Reagan had been shot. And then in January of 1986, by then I had graduated and uh, gone off to college. And then I ended up at Central State University in Edmond, Oklahoma, and a bunch of my buddies and I had all, I think there was maybe four or five of us, had all pitched in to rent a three-bedroom house. And um, we didn't necessarily have to share bedrooms because a couple of us had girlfriends in Edmond, and we spent most of our time there and just kind of kept our clothes at the house. on. It was also a house on Broadway, but it was in Edmond. And so uh, basically in the mornings, I would zip over to the house and uh, get ready for class, and then I would go to class. And so that morning uh, in January of 86, I had gotten ready for class, and I was getting ready to go, and all the and we didn't have like a big TV uh, in the living room, but I, we had like a little TV in the kitchen. And uh, um, I saw a lot of my roommates were there in the kitchen, so I went in to see what was going on and uh, caught sight of a replay of the Challenger exploding and uh, ask them what was going on, and they said that the Challenger had exploded. And I mean, that was probably one of the biggest shocks that I had have ever experienced. It was just something that happened, and you you could just almost hardly believe that it had happened. And they kept playing it over and over. And unfortunately, it was the shuttle mission where they finally let a civilian, uh, which was a teacher. Uh, go up on the space shuttle. And then again, you know, right after takeoff, it exploded and it was live. I mean, all these people's families were sitting there watching. The The world was watching live uh, on television and, you know, you didn't really understand what had happened. Uh, and so, but the Challenger uh, had exploded. And uh, I think I went ahead and went to school but of course, in every class, that was the big uh, topic that everybody was talking about. And um, everybody was just really, really somber. And it was uh, 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 just a huge blow to, uh, to the United States. So I, I remember that well. Um, and then in August of 1986, not long after that, um, I had graduated from college in May of 86 and wanted to stay in Oklahoma City and not go back to Enid. And so I had gotten a job and I needed a place to live. So I'd looked in the newspaper and there had been an ad for a room rental on a house in Edmond. And so I went and talked to the guy and his name was Ray and he owned the house and he was just renting out one of his rooms because it's a college town and that was just giving him some extra income. And so I rented a room in his house uh, from him. And so I was living there working in Oklahoma City. And then my girlfriend was still going to college and living in an apartment on the other side of Edmond. So this next uh, light bulb memory is the uh, Edmond Post Office Massacre. And so what happened there was the house that I was living in was literally five blocks from the Edmond Post Office. And that morning, uh, the, the shooting happened really early in the morning. And that morning, I was driving from her apartment to my house to get ready to go to work. And so to get to my house, I went within like four blocks of the post office. And I was literally sitting at a stoplight four blocks from the Edmond Post Office while the shooting was happening. And I got home and started getting ready for work. And then I could hear helicopters um, all over the area, uh, turned on the news and found out that uh, there was something going on in Edmond. Then you could hear sirens and, um, you know, finally went to work and found out that uh, one of the employees had gone in. And I believe uh, he killed... Uh, 14 people and injured six others. And so this was only five blocks from where I lived. And, and what was, you know, was so weird was that I was literally 
out driving fairly close to the post office while that was going on. So um, that's a memory that I'll never forget uh, what happened there. Uh, the next one is April of 1995. By then, uh, I had uh, married Denise and we had moved to Enid and I was the advertising director at uh, Evans Drug. And so um, that was uh, the April of 1995 was the Murrah bomb uh, bombing in Oklahoma City. And so I remember that day, uh, I'd gone to work like normal, and I was at work, and I listened to, uh, usually just listen to talk radio all day long. And that morning, I remember uh, my boss's mom, Lillian, coming, and I can't remember if she called or came in and told us, but she said that there had been a big explosion in downtown Oklahoma City. And you know, at first you don't really think much about it. And in my mind, it was, you know, oh, there was probably some type of gas leak. And I think maybe the news even at that time reported, um, you know, that there might have been this huge gas leak that exploded. And then listening to talk radio, they started talking, you know, they're not in Oklahoma, but they started talking about it. It was, it became that big a deal. So uh, turned on the TV in the office and man, the first view of the building, you know, then they had helicopters flying around it showing uh, live footage of the building. And it was a very large building and the entire front of the building was gone and you could see inside every floor. And so at that point you knew that it was not uh, a gas explosion. You knew that something had happened. And so the day, as the day went on, you know, they started figuring things out. And uh, being in Oklahoma, it was 24-hour coverage for several days. Uh, the Oklahoma City radio stations were covering it. Uh, there was a lot of search and rescue going on. Uh, even the national media, you know, was covering it, you know, 24-7 almost. And so after, I think, about a day or two, they were still searching. Um, just had this urge to go to Oklahoma City. So we drove to Oklahoma City. Uh, well, this was before, this was 95. This was before Denise and I uh, were married. This I had moved to Enid and was working for her dad. Um, so uh, me and my ex-wife had driven down to Oklahoma City and they'd put up a chain link fence around the area of the building to keep people, you know, from coming in. And but you could stand there, you know, just a few hundred feet away and see the lights on and see them digging and, and still looking for people that might have been trapped. And then even by then, which was just a few days after the bombing, people had already started putting uh, teddy bears and flowers and all kinds of things in the chain link fence. And I think some of those chain link fences are in the museum uh, there near where the building was. So um, so that's a, uh, a light bulb memory that I'll never forget was the day uh, the Murrow bombing happened. And then we move, then um, by then uh, we go to October of 95 and uh, we're talking about the OJ trial. And so I was still working for Evans and I had bought a house on West Cherokee in Enid, which is literally still in the same neighborhood of where all of the houses were that I grew up. And so I was living on West Cherokee, and I'd been super interested in the OJ trial. So this was the day that the OJ verdict was read. And so I'd been keeping up with the trial, as I think almost the entire country had been. And basically from the moment they arrested him, I felt like he was guilty uh, and just, you know, watching everything, I just knew that they were going to find him guilty at trial. And so that day I had gone home for lunch and I think I was going home for lunch just to be able to watch some of the trial. And that day at lunch, they made an announcement that they had a verdict and they would be announcing it pretty quick. And so I stayed home uh, to wait on the verdict. And so I remember I was in my house on Cherokee when they read the verdict and man, I was, my jaw hit the floor when they said not guilty. I could not believe it. So um, that was a flash bulb memory for me the day OJ was uh, found not guilty. 
The next one, move on to May of 1999. By, by May of 1999, uh, Denise and I had gotten married. Uh, I was still the advertising director at Evans Drug, but Denise had decided to go back to college and um, go to dental hygiene school. And so we were married, uh, and so what we decided to do was move to Oklahoma City, basically right between Edmond and Oklahoma City. We rented an apartment, and so she would go down to down down to uh, school there uh, by the uh, Capitol and uh, to dental hygiene school, and then I would drive from Edmond up to Enid and just do my normal job, and then I would drive back at night. And so I was commuting between Edmund and Enid for, I, I can't remember, a year or two um, while she was going to dental hygiene school. And so one, I think it was on a Monday, uh, May of 1999, uh, had gotten back and we were sitting there. And of course, May is storm season in Oklahoma. And these major storms had been popping up all day long. And there was one that had started in the southern part of the state and was just cruising along, and I think it was uh, creating tornadoes along the way. And so in Oklahoma, if there's tornadoes uh, or the possibility of tornadoes, all three of our major uh, news stations will cover the weather 24-7. I mean, they'll just start covering it, and they won't stop for anything. No commercials, no television shows. And basically, they keep you aware of exactly where the storms are, where the tornadoes are. Now, in May of uh, 1999, they weren't as exact as they are today, but they were still pretty good. They could tell you, you know, where the storm was heading and, and people that needed to get out of the way uh, that, that it was approaching. And so we continued to watch throughout the afternoon uh, these tornadoes march, and they were heading up towards a more Oklahoma, and it seems like as it was getting close to more, we'd been watching it for a couple of hours. I got this bright idea to go try to see. I think I think by then, I think a large tornado had formed, and it just was not going away. And so I thought I told Denise, "Hey, if we drive over by Midwest City, we might be able to see the tornado." So we got in my Honda Prelude and drove from Edmond towards uh, Midwest City. Well, this had been on the news for so long, and it was storming outside. There were storms um, that almost all the highways in Oklahoma City were clear. There was just not a whole lot of traffic out. Uh, and we even saw sheriff cars, you know, under overpasses just waiting for the storm to approach. And so we had a clear shot, you know, almost no traffic all the way to Midwest City. And we were listening on the radio to, you know, where the tornado was, just so we were aware. And, and as we got closer, you could see the storm, but it was huge and it was black. And you could not see the tornado because it was rain wrapped and it was so big. And the closer you got, the harder it was to see. And then you got into rain. But um, we finally ended up heading towards uh, Dell City and made it into Dell City, uh, right where Rose State College is, right. So the tornado went right towards Rose State College, but lifted. Uh, just our luck that it lifted right as we caught up to it, which is probably good. Um, and it lifted and then kind of, you know, didn't wipe out. Um, you know, the area of Dell City where we were. So, but as we pulled into the area around Rose State College, there was r real heavy uh, cement benches that had been knocked over. There was rubble and things, leaves and limbs and trees laying everywhere. And there was just stuff, just stuff uh, floating out of the sky, just just covering everything. And so we started to drive around a little bit, noticed that there were streets where the power poles, the wooden power poles, had all been toppled over, but they hadn't like fallen down on the ground. They were just leaning. And so the picture on curtistucker.com for this blog post is one of the pictures I took 
And I believe this was before iPhone. So I think I took it with my little camera. I only took like, I think three pictures, but this, this, that was one of the pictures. And luckily being in my Honda Prelude, we were able to still drive down the streets with the power poles, you know, leaning and uh, eventually decided it was starting to get dark. Uh, and so we decided we better get out of there. Well, by then, uh, they had the, um, you know, police and fire and ambulances had all shown up in, in the area and were blocking things off. And so we had to drive uh, quite a ways east and go up north and, and go around to get back to our apartment because there was just no way of going back directly the way that we were because of all the damage. And so that was a uh, huge F5 tornado. And so I'll never remember, never forget where I was as that tornado was uh, doing a lot of destruction in the Oklahoma City area. So the next one uh, is is 911, which again, we um, had a remembrance yesterday. So when 911 happened, uh, September 11th of uh, 2001, I was still working at Evans Drug. And at that point, we were living, um, I think we were living here. I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, I think we were living in this house the first time. So the, this is the second time we've lived in this house. So I think in 90, in 2001, 2001. Or we might have been living on Seneca. Anyway, we were living in this neighborhood. And so uh, basically I would watch um, Fox and Friends in the morning as I was getting ready and then go to work. And so that morning I remember uh, Fox and Friends was on and I remember them and I wasn't super paying attention to what they were talking about. But I do remember them starting to talk about an airplane had flown into one of the World Trade Towers and... So uh, eventually they started showing video and I went over and looked and they didn't really have any details. And at one point they had mentioned airliner, at another point they had mentioned a propeller plane. And so to me, I just assumed it was an accident. Somebody had been flying a propeller plane and had either gotten lost and had a heart attack or, you know, some, it was some accident, uh, you know. And so I went to work thinking that. And of course, things got worse. So uh, by the time I got to work, um, turned on talk radio and man, the uh, talk radio was lit up with what was going on in New York City. And so I turned on the television at work and uh, saw on TV the second plane flying into the second tower. And as soon as that happened, it just became eerie. Um, you know, then they started speculating on the news and, <clears throat> and it was just weird. And then they started canceling, um, you know, air airplanes and then, and then the air liner hit the Pentagon. And then a little bit later, the uh, plane went down in Pennsylvania. And so by that point, we kind of knew that basically the United States was being attacked with our own airplanes. And so as it was happening, it was frightening. It was weird. It was, and and then you didn't know when it was going to stop. You know, we didn't know, you know, is this going to go on in 10 other cities and is this going to be going on all day long? Or, you know, you just, at that point, you just didn't know what was happening. Now, of course, they were canceling flights and getting airplanes out of the air, but uh, still at that point, you just didn't know um, what was going on. But I do remember uh, the probably one of the strangest feelings I've ever had in my life. I mean, I'm sure this is what people feel like in the countries that are at war. And, you know, you're just living, you know, your everyday life. And then all of a sudden, your country is being attacked and bombed and buildings are blowing up and people are dying. And, and you don't, you don't deal with that in the United States. Um, I, you know, we, we had had Pearl Harbor, but Pearl Harbor wasn't in the United States. It was on this island, you know, and of course I wasn't even alive. But um, but this was an attack inside the United States and, you know, an attack on the largest buildings in the United States. And so it was uh, really overwhelming. Um, 
People didn't know what to do, didn't know how to react. I know I was ready uh, from day one for the United States to fly over and start dropping bomb after bomb after bomb on anybody that was involved. And um, I would have, uh, good thing I wasn't president. Uh, I'd have been bombing a lot of people and uh, probably more than uh, I should. But anyway, uh, I do remember that being one of the weirdest, most surreal feelings um, that I've ever had and, and have, have not had that type of feeling since. And so uh, it was, it's quite a, quite a time to remember uh, where you were when you heard and, and what you remember from that time. And then the last uh, flashbulb memory that I have is the day that Farrah Fawcett died slash the day that Michael Jackson died. And so that happened in June of 2009. Uh, and so uh, by 2009, I think we were living here in this house. And so Denise and I and a bunch of couples had gone on vacation to Cancun. And we were in Cancun. And of course, you know, throughout the day, I would do updates for uh, some of my businesses. You know, basically all my businesses were online. And I think at that time I was blogging quite a bit at curtistucker.com and I was uploading photos of our trip to Cancun and trying to, you know, post the most recent photos so the girls who were back here in Enid could see what we were up to. And so each morning I would get up and again, this was, uh, what I say, 2009. So this was kind of before every hotel room had Wi-Fi. And so they, they had free Wi-Fi in their lobby, but only in the lobby. And so our room was on a floor that had a balcony overlooking the lobby. And so I could go stand in the corner of this hallway and balcony and overlook the lobby. But I, it was enough, I was close enough to be able to pick up the uh, Wi-Fi. So I was standing there updating my websites, and I, and I was going to post some pictures the most recent pictures that we had taken in Cancun, and I noticed that curtistucker.com was offline. It wasn't even online anymore. And so uh, got to digging around, got into the back end of things, and found out that all of the bandwidth for the website was gone. And the bandwidth is the amount of uploading and downloading you can do. You know, sometimes there's a limit, and once you reach that limit, it shuts the website off and nobody can download or upload anything anymore. And so uh, back in that day, I was a web hosting reseller. And so I hosted a lot of websites for people. And so each website, I would put a, you know, a maximum bandwidth that each of these websites could use. That way they didn't use up all of it and, and I get charged more money. And so just out of habit, I would put a max on all of my websites as well. Well, that morning, all of the bandwidth for my curtistucker.com blog was gone. So I got in and I increased the bandwidth and of course the website popped back on and you can look at your stats and you can see which pages or which images um, are you were using up all of the bandwidth. And so I looked and I noticed that it was the photo from 1976 of me holding the Farrah Fawcett poster. And uh, that got me wondering. And so I checked the news and that's when I found out that Farrah had passed away. And it wasn't a huge shock. I mean, she was a, a huge icon in my life. You know, I was a huge Farrah and Charlie's Angels fan, but we did know that she had uh, cancer prior uh, to when she passed away, and I believe uh, it had been in the news that her cancer had come back. And so it wasn't a total shock um, that she had passed away, but what had happened was people were writing stories and doing blog posts, and they were looking for photos to use in their articles and stuff, and so they were going to Google Images. Well, at that time, I was really good at getting websites and images ranked really high in Google. And so that Farrah Fawcett poster picture was ranked really high, but it wasn't even just a picture of the poster. It was a picture of me um, at uh, 14 years old, I think, 
holding the poster. And so what I found out was a lot of people were trying to find different pictures other than just a rectangle image of the poster. They were, you know, trying to more personalize their articles and stories about fair. And so tons, I don't, you know, probably thousands of people were downloading that photo. And before it was all said and done, CNN had gotten the photo and contacted me, uh, did a story. They had it on their website. Um, the photo has since, there's an article on curtisducker.com about it. It's been used in every Farrah um, tribute since then. It was used in magazines and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, so I remember that being the day that Farrah died. But unfortunately for Farrah, the grief over her dying only lasted a short period of time because then uh, Michael Jackson died later that day and his death was totally unexpected. Uh, he had been uh, doing press conferences and talking about his new tour coming up. And um, so he was in the news. He looked healthy. I mean, you know, for Michael Jackson uh, being skinny, but he still looked alive. So uh, it was a huge, probably one of the biggest celebrity shocks uh, was when he passed away. And of course, and like I say, he passed away on the same day that Farah had passed away. And so uh, I do remember the day that uh, I was in Cancun, the day that both of those celebrities passed away. So those are my uh, biggest flashbulb memories. Uh, you guys, uh, let me know if any of those are the same flashbulb memories that you guys have, or if there's some that you guys have that um, I'm not thinking of. I know doing a little bit of research on this and looking at some of the events that that like large numbers of people have flashball memories of, um, a lot of people remember where they were when they heard that Princess Diana had passed away, and I don't. I, I remember, you know, I remember her passing away and the crash, but I don't remember where I was when I heard it. That was one of the, one of the events that, um, I don't remember. And then, you know, JFK, I was, you know, just a little baby. Don't remember that. But, uh, most of the big, uh, bigger events, I do remember, uh, where I was. And so, so that's my list. You guys hit me up at shags at shaggyduck.com or curtis at curtistucker.com. Those are my emails. Um, let me know your flashbulb memories. Let me know uh, some episode ideas or let me know which episodes you've listened to in the past that you liked that you might want more episodes like those. Uh, just, you know, give me some ideas and I could try to do more of those. Don't forget to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe or subscribe on whichever podcasting app you guys are using. Uh, don't forget to come and check out the uh, video and check out my Art Aruni t-shirt. Uh, just go to the website and check out the designs that I have on there now. Again, I'll be adding a lot more uh, designs to Art Aruni. Don't forget, I also do the 70s Buzz podcast with Todd, Buzzhead Radio podcast with Todd, and then I also do a little uh, podcast called the Enid Buzz podcast about uh, our hometown right here in Enid. So uh, staying busy with lots of stuff and uh, just trying to think of what I'm going to be doing for this podcast on my next episode. You guys take care and I will talk to you soon. See ya. See ya.